gets more than ever before. Right from the top, there's a wealth of most unlikely success stories. But the unforgiving glare of the spotlight sometimes turns traditional heroes into forlorn figures. It's a year fraught with controversy on the court and confrontation often. There's no counting anyone out. Tales of the unexpected abound. The exultant winners, the despondent losers, the indomitable competitors, they're all part of Sports 81, the George Plimpton Scrapbook, with your host, George Plimpton. Sports 81, the George Plimpton Scrapbook, is brought to you by Miller High Life. If you've got the time, we've got the beer. And by Intellivision, endless entertainment from Mattel Electronics. And by the genius of Betamax, and naturally it's from Sony, the one and only. George Plimpton, and these images behind me are pages from my 1981 sports scrapbook. It used to be that sports scrapbooks are made up of things like newspaper clippings, ticket stubs, and photographs. But modern day collections come in the form of video. I've edited my scrapbook very judiciously, down to 90 minutes, and it's simply bulging with indelible images. Those memorable confrontations, Leonard, Hearns, Borg, McEnroe, Coe, Avet, and Billy Martin, and his umpires. And then the prodigious feats of new heroes like the great Gretzky and El Toro. So on to page one, day one, and the battle for numero uno. In the spirit of the new year, college football's premier teams vow to make a run for number one on their annual day of reckoning. The Cotton Bowl features a 9-2 Alabama team which simply overmatches the Baylor Bears and the Crimson Tide's Major Ogilvy becomes the first player ever to rush for a touchdown in four straight bowl games. The pigskin parade continues in Pasadena as the Michigan Wolverines try to snap the Big Ten streak of six straight losses in the Rose Bowl. Against the Washington Huskies, Michigan breaks from the Big Ten tradition by unveiling the John Wangler to Anthony Carter aerial show, a much better entertainment value than the three yards and a cloud of dust routine. With an outside shot at a national title, Michigan then turns to its stingy defense to protect it. And the Huskies are held to just two field goals, the sixth straight game in which Michigan has kept its opponents from scoring a touchdown. Finally, after seven straight postseason losses, the Wolverines give head coach Bo Schembechler his first bowl game success. New Year's night in Miami spotlights an Orange Bowl rematch, and Michael Keeling's record 53-yard field goal for Oklahoma shatters a Florida State shutout. The Sooners figure better late than never, and David Overstreet's wishbone ramble as the Big Eight champs on top. But fourth-ranked Oklahoma gives the ball up five times on seven fumbles, and the second-ranked Seminoles help themselves to a seven-point fourth-quarter lead. The Sooners' J.C. Watts has saved his secret weapon, the pass, for last. Oklahoma trails by just one now, and they're going for two. This dramatic come-from-behind victory gives Oklahoma its ninth Orange Bowl win in 12 tries. But the sweetest pot of all is in the Sugar Bowl, where the top-ranked and undefeated Georgia Bulldogs bear down on a national title against Notre Dame. Freshman folk hero Herschel Walker takes the early plunge, and the Bulldogs' swarming, opportunistic defense continually takes the bite out of a stymied Irish attack. Despite being outgained by more than 200 yards, 
Georgia stays on the minds of voters for the top spot as Walker rushes for two touchdowns and 150 yards, a better net gain than that of his entire team's slumbering offense. But Notre Dame earlier knocked Alabama out of the running for number one, and now they're playing the spoiler role again. A one-yard jaunt by Phil Carter brings the Irish to within seven points, and Notre Dame is threatening divine intervention in the Bulldogs' best laid plan. But with time running out, Georgia blunts one last challenge, and now with Georgia's number one son, Jimmy Carter, in attendance, the Bulldogs wrap up their first ever number one ranking. President Carter was about to be replaced as the country's number one citizen by a former actor whose most notable performance came in Newt Rockney, All-American. In the same week as Ronald Reagan's inauguration, one of the top pitchers of the past two decades was voted into baseball's Hall of Fame. In his first year of eligibility, the Cardinals' Bob Gibson is welcomed into Cooperstown. Gibson's marvelous career featured seven World Series wins and one 17 strikeout masterpiece in the 68 series. With 251 wins and more than 3,000 strikeouts, Gibson was the pride of St. Louis. Later in 81, another former Cardinal, Johnny Big Cat Mize, is elected to the Hall by the Veterans Committee. After a stint with the Giants, Mize played for the Yankee teams that won five straight World Series. Elected with Rube Foster, the organizer of Black League Baseball, Mize was a career 312 hitter with power. The only player ever to hit three home runs in a game six times. The good old days are what many National Hockey League fans are pining for. The expansion age of more teams and more games seems a bit too fast and furious, a touch out of control. But for a brief moment on January 24th, the Islanders' Mike Bossy takes the hockey buffs back to the halcyon era. Scoring his 50th goal in the 50th game of the season, Bossy equals Rocket Richard's ancient record. Swimming records rarely reach such landmark status, for it seems there's always a new kid in the pool just an arm's length faster. 17-year-old Tracy Calkin sets four world records in one meet, further proving this fragility while establishing her own preeminence. Once the preeminent goal scorer in hockey, Phil Esposito finds the encroachment of age robbing his incomparable scoring skills. So at age 38, the second leading scorer in NHL history bids farewell. Espo was clearly slowing down when he retired, but it must have been a murderous decision for him. Aging athletes, especially the truly great ones, often harbor that dream that somehow they'll be able to regain the glory one more time. This persistence can be humbling, but sometimes it pays off, as in the case of Jim Plunkett of the Oakland Raiders. The 33-year-old quarterback is the leader of a miraculous Oakland Raider revival. Start this whole year. Yeah. From day one, we were marked as being last place, and all of a sudden we're at the top of the heap. Because regardless, if we were favored in the point spread, we were still underdogs from day one. The Oakland Raiders, picked to finish last in their division, are riding the remarkable comeback of Jim Plunkett right into the Super Bowl. Plunkett, once the cast-off and considered washed up, sweeps the Raiders past the Oilers, Browns, and Chargers, and the Jim Plunkett saga heads to Bourbon Street. The Dallas Cowboys, so-called America's team, would settle for being the NFC's team in the Super Bowl. But Philadelphia's upstart Eagles have the most effective defense in football, and they rudely cancel the Cowboys' travel plans. A decisive 20-7 Eagles win is salted away by Leroy Harris. And for the first time in 21 years, the birds are flying to an NFL championship game. Two weeks pass before the quest of Oakland and Philly can reach fruition, as the two teams are held hostage by the pregame hoopla. Super Bowl 15 is the Eagles' first, and on the third play of the game, Ron Jaworski exhibits some supersized jitters. Rod Martin's interception sets an early tone of Raider cool and eagle desperation. Jim Plunkett, now exuding confidence, methodically picks apart the vaunted bird defense, and Cliff Branch's two-yard touchdown puts Oakland on top. It's a day when apparent glory turns to gloom for the men in green. A spectacular bit of improv by Jaworski looks like six, but it goes for naught thanks to a penalty. Even the proud Eagle D is being shut out as Plunkett gets time to conduct his magic act. Now you see him, now you don't. It's a Super Bowl record 80-yard touchdown from Plunkett to Kenny King, and these rowdy freewheeling Raiders are making a rout of it. 
Leading 14-3 in the third quarter, Plunkett follows the fairy tale script, sending up a pass and a prayer. Cliff Branch answers the call, and Plunkett's wildest dreams are coming true. The Eagles trail by three touchdowns, and no late-game heroics can alter the outcome now. Overall, Philly gets more first downs and runs more offensive plays than Oakland, and the Eagles are outgained by only 17 yards. But the Birds just couldn't come up with the big play, whether it was mistakes or whistles that blew them dead. A fourth-quarter touchdown pass from Jaworski to Keith Krepley is merely academic, and the final score is 27-10. The Raiders become the first wild card entry to take the top prize and a third interception sets a Super Bowl record for Rod Martin, another Raider reclamation project. Raiders coach Tom Flores has brought Oakland its second Super Bowl crown and the man whose courageous comeback paved the way, Jim Plunkett, one spot over the hill, is elected Super Bowl 15's most valuable player. George? Well, I might as well tell you about a personal election I'm staging in this 90 minutes. The electorate? Well, it's me, since it's my scrapbook. I'm going to pick the top performer of each month. And then after conferring with all the voters, I'm going to pick the top performer of the year. And if you don't like that pick, well, stay with me. You'll have 12 more chances to disagree. So to kick it off, I'm electing Jim Plunkett as January's top performer. We'll be back with more of Sports 81, the George Plimpton scrapbook, in a moment. Who is this man breaking away from the pack? Well, he won five speed skating gold medals in the 1980 Olympics. And in February 1981, he won the Sullivan Award as the nation's outstanding athlete. He's Eric Hyden, and now he never leaves home without his bicycle. Ironically, in the same month, that Hayden won the Sullivan Award, Jim Craig, the goalie of the 1980 Olympic hockey team, was benched by the Boston Bruins. Of course, when a fellow like Wayne Gretzky is bearing down on you, all the gold medals in the world won't help you. 20-year-old Wayne Gretzky is already being compared to all-time greats like Orr and Bellavo. On his way to a second straight MVP award and a record 164 points, the great Gretzky becomes hockey's top drawing card. Meanwhile, boxing's biggest card is called off when promoter Harold Smith flees from a swirl of criminal charges. Then the little big man of the NBA chases after one of the big boys' records. The Rockets' Calvin Murphy lights up free throw after free throw in February, staying hot in pursuit of Rick Berry's mark of 60 in a row. The race for stock car supremacy is being run at speeds approaching 200 miles an hour, as Bobby Allison stalks Richard Petty in the 23rd running of the Daytona 500. For the seventh time, Petty wins prestigious Daytona, proving he's still the king of the speedways. Back in the arenas, the war of the backboards is being waged by the best amateur teams in the land. Unlike that other sport, the poles don't mean a hoot in college hoops, and these top build quintets will have to take on all comers in the upcoming NCAA tourney. Okay now, quiet down for Calvin. Murphy not only ups the record to 78 straight, but sets a new season mark of 96%. And another milestone is notched by Julius Irving, who scores his 20,000th point as the Sixers approach the playoffs on top. In the shortest month, one might think of giving the vote to the tallest performers. But I'm giving my vote for February's Performer of the Month to one of the swiftest set, Wayne Gretzky, the greatest show on ice. Hockey fights its way into the headlines through the winter, and the next month features an inexorable march toward a National Hockey League record by crafty right-winger Guy Lafleur of the Montreal Canadiens. In his ten pro seasons, Lafleur has been a first-team All-Star six times and won three scoring titles. Now against Winnipeg on March 4th, the 29-year-old Lafleur scores his 1,000th point in only his 720th game, the quickest ever in the NHL. Another star flowering on a hockey rink is Steve Jungle, but his game is indoor soccer. Jungle's the top celebrity and leading scorer of the major indoor soccer league, and his magnetic touch leads the New York Arrows to their third straight championship. The 26-year-old Yugoslav Jungle is being called the Pele, even the Nureyev of indoor soccer, and the sport seems to be on the rise. Phil Mayer is America's top hope in another sport, which usually finds us as also-rans. In a grueling four-month, 31-event competition, 
Mare outlast three-time champion Ingemar Stenmark to become the first American ever to win the World Cup. In warmer climes, Houston sophomore Carl Lewis becomes the first since Jesse Owens to win both the long jump and sprint at the NCAA Indoor Championships. When Owens completed that feat in 1936, Jumbo Elliott was in his second year as Villanova's head track coach. Elliott dies in March 81 after winning 51 titles in six distinguished decades of coaching. DePaul's Ray Meyer has been at it almost as long, but he's still looking for his first NCAA title. His top-ranked Blue Demons are the tourney favorites, but now they're clinging desperately to a one-point lead over Feisty St. Joseph's. With just three seconds left, John Smith puts the Hawks ahead, and time runs out on DePaul. It's a stunning upset win for Jim Lynham's Hawks over the Goliath of college basketball. In the East Regional, the upset comes courtesy of BYU's Danny Ainge. A coast-to-coast -coast one man floor show by Ainge, a 6'5 senior guard, hands Brigham Young the win and sends another of college basketball's high and mighty tumbling. In the Midwest, defending champion Louisville is up against Arkansas, and the Cardinals are trying to restore a semblance of order to this topsy-turvy turning. Derek Smith's clutch basket puts the champs up by one, and it appears their crown is safe for now. Pounce if it goes. Sue-wee! The Arkansas Razorbacks win it at the buzzer, sending hog country Howlin' and Louisville heading home. That 49-foot heave-ho by U.S. Reed wins our first annual Bromo Award in a tournament of upsets. By opening up the tourney to 48 teams, the NCAA was asking for chaos, and as you just saw, got it. It was great fun for a while, but finally the underdogs were subdued, and the semifinals featured four of the favorites. Then North Carolina beat Virginia, and Indiana got by LSU to set up a final between two teams who'd been there before. In Philadelphia Spectrum, where they won the crown in 76, the spirited Indiana Hoosiers are trying to be just a bit finer than North Carolina. Typical of Bobby Knight's teams is a textbook offensive efficiency and a clawing man-to-man -man defense. But Al Wood's silken moves gives Hoosier fans an early nightmare. As the first half comes to an end, Randy Whitman's bombs puncture the Carolina zone and it's a tenuous 27-26 Indiana lead. But after the intermission, the Tar Heels come unglued and the Hoosiers take a page from the book of Isaiah. Following the lead of their little child, sophomore guard Isaiah Thomas, Indiana runs off a back-breaking 18-8 streak. NC beat these Hoosiers last December, but they're doubting Thomas's no longer. Captain Isaiah Thomas sees to that, scoring 23 points and becoming the third straight point guard to win the tourney's MVP award. Indiana tops North Carolina 63 to 50, and the 26 and 9 Hoosiers are knighted as NCAA champion. As you've seen, March was a busy month with lots of candidates for the performer of the month. It came down, I thought, to two, Bobby Knight and Phil Mayer. So I've decided to base my selection on purely scientific data. Phil Mayer. In a sport we generally associate with leisure rather than competition, Phil Mayer has won the title emblematic of the world's best. So maybe Mayer's triumph will help spur a new skiing tradition in America. The George Plimpton scrapbook returns in a moment. In April, a new kind of ball burst onto the scene as the hottest act in sports. No, it wasn't racquetball or stickball, paddleball or stoopball. The new sensation was Billy Ball and his proponents were baseball's best team through the month of April. The A's have been turned around dramatically, and all of Oakland is celebrating manager Billy Martin. The toast of the town knows every diamond party needs good pitching, and he's assembled a staff of revelers who don't leave till the festivities are over. Martin's moundsmen chalk up 15 complete games in the season's first 18, and the A's are stealing wins in every way imaginable. Tony Armas dials eight for long distance six times in those first 18 games, and Oakland is off to a mind-boggling 17-1 start, including a record 11 straight wins before their first loss. This shocking transformation to aggressive big play baseball is being witnessed by record crowds, and the feeling is that nothing can stop them now because the A's have mastered the art of Billy Ball. 
In Augusta, Georgia, Tom Watson is having a blast at the Masters Golf Tourney. This brilliant bunker shot on the next to the last hole allows the reigning king of golf to hang on to a precarious two-stroke lead. The imperturbable Watson staves off challenges from Jack Nicklaus and Johnny Miller to win his fifth major and second Masters crown. Watson figures, if the jacket fits, wear it. On the 85th occasion of road racing's most prestigious event, nearly 7,000 runners take part despite stringent entrance requirements. While a close lookout is kept for a return appearance by Rosie Ruiz, three-time winner Bill Rogers is coming up short in his bid for a fourth straight success. The Japanese Seiko finishes the best marathon ever run in the United States, and New Zealand's Allison Rowe runs the second fastest time ever recorded by a woman marathoner. Two more speedy athletes make a splash in April, as four American swimming records are shattered in three days by the tireless Tracy Calkins. And high Stephen Edwin Moses continues to be simply unbeatable at his specialty, the 400-meter hurdles. The same month marks the emergence of another invincible performer whose specialty is the screwball. 20-year-old rookie Fernando Valenzuela baffles National League batters and captivates Los Angeles rooters with his phenomenal success story. The Dodgers' own Bambino bats 438 in April to go along with his impeccable pitching and the legend of Fernando grows to preposterous proportion. El Toro pitches five complete game wins in April, allowing only one earned run in 45 innings. As unhittable as he is, that's how magnetic is Fernando. It is this charisma that eludes heavyweight champion Larry Holmes, whose unanimous decision over Trevor Burbick goes largely unnoticed. Even as Larry Holmes continued his reign, the welterweight division of Leonard and Hearns was boxing's most glamorous in 1981. A very far cry from the late 1930s and 40s, when a quiet and dignified champion ruled the heavyweight division. Brown Bomber's reign transcended his sport and his race. And he was one of America's most cherished heroes. I've given you some extra time to choose your top performer of April. But for me, no contest at all. Fernando Valenzuela. El Toro, they called him. And he mesmerized Los Angeles. And he had folks calling him a Mexican Babe Ruth. The first Saturday in May is, of course, Derby Day, when the best three-year-old thoroughbreds come to Churchill Downs for the most prestigious horse race of all. While I tend to my Mint Julep, one of America's foremost racing personalities, Marshall Cassidy, will take us to the 107th run for the Roses. Thank you, George. The two-to-one favorite was Proud Appeal, an easy winner in the Bluegrass Stakes, joined by Pleasant Colony and Cure the Blues. But Pleasant Colony, a long shot winner in the wood, was being called a living cinch by his trainer, Johnny Campo. Let's get to the start. Mythical Ruler is now going into the starting gate. That's the 20th horse of 21 horses in this field. The final horse to go in will be representing the California division. That's Flying Nashua in the bright red silks. This is the 107th running of the Kentucky Derby at Churchill Downs. And they're off. It's a cavalry charge as they pass the stands the first time. Going for the lead, Golden Derby, Habano, Proud Appeal, Top Avenger, Well-Decorated, Bold Ego, Mythical Ruler, and Hoedown's Day. Around the far turn, Top Avenger is now headed by Bold Ego on the outside. Bold Ego now takes the lead, Top Avenger in second, Parte gaining ground very quickly on the outside. Parte now takes second, it's Top Avenger back into third, then Proud Appeal past the tab. 
Gaining ground now is Pleasant Colony. They're at the top of the stretch. Bold Eagle on the inside. Partey on the outside. Partey now takes the lead. Bold Eagle back into second. Pleasant Colony moving up on the far outside. Pleasant Colony now alongside Partey. Pleasant Colony now takes the lead. Partey back into second. On the outside past the tap. Here comes Woodchopper. Woodchopper passing many tired horses as they approach the wire. Pleasant Colony has the lead by three and a half. Partey in second. Woodchopper is gaining. Woodchopper now takes second. Woodchopper gaining on Pleasant Colony at the wire. It's Pleasant Colony, the winner by three quarters of a length. Woodchopper was second. Partey was third in the 107th Kentucky Derby. So Johnny Campo, the fat man, was right. You might say, give that man a cigar, but then he's already got one. So why don't we save the stogies for the fellows about whom it said, close but no cigar. Lenny Randall is one such fella, and he's given us the top comic moment of my scrapbook. <laughs> Lenny Randall's hot air routine is to no avail, but in the upcoming second leg of horse racing's Triple Crown, Derby winner Pleasant Colony is hoping once more to blow by the field. Around the far turn and Bold Ego maintains the lead throughout this race by a length. Gaining ground on the far outside is Pleasant Colony, winner of the Kentucky Derby. Then it's 38 paces for East still back on the rail, then a run. They are approaching the top of the stretch. Bold Ego has the lead by a length and a half. Paristo on the rail in second. Pleasant Colony on the outside. Pleasant Colony now takes second. Paristo back into third, then 38 paces in fourth. It's Bold Ego leading down the stretch by a length and a half. Pleasant Colony gaining ground gradually on the outside. Pleasant Colony alongside Bold Ego at the 16th hole. Pleasant Colony now puts ahead in front. Bold Ego back into second. Paristo is third as they race to the wire. It's Pleasant Colony in front. In horse racing, only the top three performers finish in the money. But in the equal opportunity world of the National Hockey League, 16 of 21 teams make the Stanley Cup playoffs. In the first round, 14th seeded Edmonton knocks off proud Montreal in three straight. But the Oilers quickly learn that today's dynasty builders are from Long Island, and the Islanders sweep by Edmonton and the Rangers in defense of their crown. The Stanley Cup Finals feature a challenge to New York from the Minnesota North Stars, looking for their first cup championship. The Islanders' Butch Goring is still right on target in Game 5 after his pivotal hat trick in the third game crushed the North Stars' spirits. Needing this game to wrap up a five-game series win, the Islanders send out the line of Tonelli, Nystrom, and Merrick to dig up more trouble. Wayne Merrick's goal puts the Islanders up 2-0, and then the oldest Islander, 31-year-old Goring, gets his second scoring blast of the night to wrap up the series MVP award. Brian Trottier is still playing with a separated shoulder, and he scores in a record 25th straight playoff game. Celebrating their second straight Stanley Cup, the triumphant Isles seem miles ahead of the rest of the National Hockey League. In an up-and-down 1981 hockey season, there is also a cause for sadness. As Roger Doucet, the inspirational voice of Canada, who's been such a tradition in the National Hockey League, passes away at the age of 61. Sports 81, the George Plimpton scrapbook returns in a moment. May of 1981 marks the renewal of a splendid basketball rivalry. Boston versus Philadelphia in the NBA playoffs. The two teams finished with identical records, but Philly opens with a 3-1 lead in the series. Boston comes clawing back, winning two straight games by a single basket. And there wasn't a doctor in the house who could cure the Sixers' seventh game woes. Philly fails to score a field goal in the last five minutes, and they find out a bird with the ball is worth two off the board. The Celtics complete an incredible comeback, and the survivors of this titanic struggle are overwhelming favorites in the NBA Finals. From out of the West come the Houston Rockets. Led by Moses Malone, the Rockets cling tenaciously to a hope for their first NBA championship and split the first four games. But then that old Boston tradition takes over. 
Cedric Cornbread Maxwell is voted the most valuable player as even with Moses, Houston falls short of the promised land. For the 14th time, the Boston Celtics are basketball's world champions. A world title is just what Jerry Cooney has on his mind. The undefeated top heavyweight contender pummels Kenny Norton senseless in round one. It's his 21st knockout in 25 fights, and Cooney is left to wait for a shot at the crown. Meanwhile, the winningest jockey of all time reaches another milestone in May. The shoe pushes his career earnings to nearly 82 million, and he's still going strong at age 50. Still at the top of his game at age 40 is Pete Rose, who stays among the leading hitters in May while pursuing a hit record he's coveted for years. The granddaddy of all auto races turns into a battle royale, both on the track and off. Bobby Unser sets the early pace, clocking the fourth lap at better than 190 miles per hour. But it's ruled that Unser passes cars under a yellow caution flag, and Mario Andretti is declared the official Indy winner. It's the first time a driver who gets the checkered flag is stripped of his title, but later an appeal returns the honor to Unser. Andretti contests that ruling, and so the race goes on, and on, and on. It's turning out to take longer to decide who won the race than it did to run it. We can only hope they figure it out before it's time to run the next one. Looking for a clear-cut winner as our May Performer of the Year, I'll take Pleasant Colony, who will be going for the Triple Crown when we come back. The George Plimpton scrapbook continues as Pete Rose talks to the Gipper. A coronation is held on the stately lawns of Wimbledon while a tempestuous Yankee disrupts the tranquility overseas. A British miler builds further on Roger Bannister's legacy. While a USC tailback lives up to one of college football's greatest traditions. Stay tuned for the fight of the year and the performer of the year. Coming up on Sports 81, the George Plimpton scrapbook. The word strike took on a new meaning in baseball 1981 as mound conferences were replaced by litigation and infield flies gave way to injunctions. As June began, a strike seemed a fait accompli. Another sure bet in June seemed to be a triple crown for Pleasant Colony. So we go back to Marshall Cassidy for the Belmont Stakes and the third and last jewel of the triple crown. Summing leads on the rail by about three lengths as they approach the top of the stretch. Behind Summing is Pleasant Colony. Highland Wade on the outside. Escambia Bay on the rail. They're at the top of the stretch, and Summing maintains the lead by two and a half. Highland Blade on the outside now, moving into second. Pleasant Colony is third, then Escambia Bay in fourth. Then it's Woodchopper and Tap Shoes down the stretch. Summing has the lead by three and a half. Highland Blade on the outside, second by Annette. Pleasant Colony is back into third. There's going to be an upset past the eighth ball. Summing still leads by three. Highland Blade is second, gaining on the outside. Pleasant Colony still in third. They race to the wire. Summing still leads. Highland Blade is closing. Summing in front. And at the wire, it's Summing the winner by three quarters of a length. Then Highland Blade was second. Pleasant Colony was third in the 113th Belmont State. In discussing Pleasant Colony's disappointing show finish, some people claimed the horse had been disturbed by a firecracker and by a cameraman at the starting gate. But Johnny Campo said simply, I have no excuses. I'm the same guy, win, lose, or draw. In the same week as Campo's disappointment, another fellow kept ever so close to an historic achievement. 40-year-old Pete Rose moved within striking distance of the National League record of 3,630 career hits held by Stan the Man Musial. Watching his mark being pursued made me dip into some of my old-time scrapbooks for another look at the man. It's appropriate that the exalted hit record is held by Stan Musial, arguably the greatest pure hitter in National League history. The man played his entire career for St. Louis, leading the Cardinals to four World Series and becoming something of a local treasure. His career 331 batting average includes 17 seasons over 300 and 10 years with more than 100 RBIs. Musial's corkscrew batting stance was unorthodox, but oh, so effective. His National League standard for most career hits has stood for 18 years. And ironically, number 3,630 was a single that eluded the reach of a Reds rookie second baseman named Pete Rose. And now the 60-year-old Hall of Famer has come to Philadelphia to join the Rose Watch. Against Nolan Ryan on June 10th, 
Pete Rose singles in his first at bat to equal the man's mark in fine style. But it'll be two months before Rose can crack the deadlock. For two days later, the baseball season grinds to an unceremonious halt. The player strike gives new meaning to the expression June swoon, and there's no joy here anymore. The rest of the sports world rolls right along, though, right along Philadelphia's main line, that is. In the second of the year's four major tournaments, David Graham is abusing Marion's unsullied East Course. Golf's top players failed to break par in three previous Opens played here. But Graham and a host of pursuers are conducting a relentless assault. Jack Nicklaus, the defending champion, is bidding for his fifth Open crown. Eventually, Nicholas is deserted by his putting stroke, and he gives way to another challenge from George Burns. After leading through three rounds, Burns falls into a second-place tie with Bill Rogers, and both better Marion's inviolate 280 by four strokes. But the most disrespectful performer is David Graham, who batters Marion into submission with uncanny accuracy from tee to green. Graham misses only one fairway all day, and he bobs all 18 greens. Wrapping up his second major tournament crown, David Graham finishes with a 67 for a 273 total, the second lowest score in U.S. Open history. The longest drama in baseball history closes in June. No, the strike is nowhere near settlement, but a 32-inning marathon between two International League teams, the Pawtucket Red Sox and the Rochester Red Wings, thankfully gets itself a final chapter. The game had been suspended on Easter morning after eight hours of play resulted in a 2-2 stalemate. Then, after being given more than two months to cool off, Pawtucket's Dave Koza strokes a bases-loaded single in the bottom of the 33rd to end baseball's longest game. It's not the way they might have dreamed it, but these minor leaguers have made it to the Hall of Fame. Heavyweight champion Larry Holmes has already ensured his place in boxing history, but he fights on with an unconquerable desire for acceptance. Leon Spinks is simply no match for Holmes' vicious two-fisted barrage. But even this crushing third-round TKO, his 38th win without a loss, does little to improve Larry Holmes' public image. The problem for Holmes seemed to be finding legitimate challenges, gaining respect. The top honors for the month of June go to Pete Rhodes for playing like a man half his age. He was hitting 330 when he tied Musial's mark, and he gave baseball fans something pleasant to talk about while those stadiums remained dark. Sports 81, the George Plimpton scrapbook, is being brought to you by In Television, endless entertainment from Mattel Electronics. And by Lowenbrow, when you want the taste of a truly great beer, there's really only one. Tonight, let it be Lowenbrow. And by the U.S. Army. The Army, a great place to be all you can be. And we'll take a look at some very special youngsters who keep on piling up the records. A return to glory for some heroes of yore and a peek at the year's top woman athletes. Baseball makes a dramatic re-entry, and the season climaxes with an explosive autumn uprising. All this and more when we return to Sports 81, the George Plimpton scrapbook. The planned site of the baseball all-star game was nothing more than a white elephant as the baseball strike ended its second month. With America's summer game tied up at Deuce, England's showcase of that the fortnight of Wimbledon took the advantage. On July 3rd, the world's most prestigious tennis tournament prepares to crown a new queen. Chris Everett Lloyd has that hungry look again in her seventh Wimbledon final, while 19-year-old Hannah Mondlikova is fighting the Wimbledon Willies in her first final. The 26-year-old Lloyd has been simply unconquerable on the lawns of Wimbledon after finishing runner-up here the last three years. She's not lost a single set all turning. And while second seeded Hannah, the French Open champ, shows flashes of brilliance, the match is entirely one-sided. It's a one-hour route for Wimbledon's adopted daughter, and Chris Everett Lloyd is the women's singles champion for the third time. From the serenity and propriety of the women's game to the stormy men's competition, and a July 4th final capping off two weeks of fireworks, courtesy of John McEnroe. Am I allowed to talk to myself and say that? 
I didn't say umpire, I said it disgraced the mankind of myself. I'd like the referee brought out, please, before you call the score. Stayed Wimbledon is stunned, and one row leads to another. Don't point your finger at me, mister. In one corner, a British champion of gossip, rebuffed after prying into McEnroe's love life. In the other, a staunch Yankee defender of his countrymen's privacy. The preliminary bouts a draw, but the main event on center court is between the top two heavyweights in tennis, Bjorn Borg and John McEnroe. The Iceman Borg is seeking his sixth straight Wimbledon crown, and McEnroe gives up his linesman's duties to concentrate on the formidable task at hand. After dropping the opening set 6-4, McEnroe wins two straight tiebreakers, and he's come within one set of deposing Borg. The implacable champion reminds all those present of his stirring comeback a year ago against this same stubborn foe. But McEnroe needs just one more game now, and he's playing undaunted. In the fourth hour, it's come down to match point, and the dogged pursuit of the 22-year-old John McEnroe finally pays off. After being embarrassed and outraged by his behavior for two weeks, England now toasts John McEnroe on the afternoon of his greatest triumph. In the same month, Great Britain plays host to another conquering hero from the States. In Sandwich, England, Texan Bill Rogers is feasting on birdies in only his second British Open appearance. It's a tournament which features an 83 by Jack Nicklaus, but Rogers is a model of consistency. The only player to break par, Bill Rogers celebrates his first major tournament victory. In honor of Rogers' Texan heritage, we bring you a bit of a contrast to the meandering pace of the linksman. It's professional rodeo, a sport for men on the move. finished Johnny said well you're pretty good old son but sit down in that chair right there and let me show you how it's done rodeo is a grueling test indeed of man's persistence one of the nation's most popular sports rodeo is also one of America's oldest traditions back to the tranquil putting green and another institution it's Arnold Palmer charging after yet another major championship Palmer is 50 now, and the tourney is the U.S. Senior Open. But a bit of that old magic remains. Palmer shoots a playoff round 70 to wrap up a victory. And the still overflowing army is reminded there will never be another like Arnie, the most beloved performer in the history of golf. The game has changed dramatically, but still it's taken Kathy Whitworth 23 years to become the first woman golfer to reach the million-dollar mark. I wonder what Kathy Whitworth thinks of the athletes who earn a million dollars a year these days. Like some of the baseball stars who were losing as much as, well, five to seven thousand dollars a day during the strike. Well now, John McEnroe also lost a few thousand quid for his behavior at Wimbledon. But McEnroe, as they call him over there, he wins the strawberries and cream as July's performer of the month, and he does that for his dethronement of King Borg. Still to come, Sugar Ray Leonard battles Hitman Hearns for the undisputed welterweight championship. And an all-blue October classic as the Yankees defend their turf in the World Series against their arch rivals, the gritty come-from-behind Dodgers. This and lots more when we return to Sports 81, the George Plimpton scrapbook. Pyrotechnics and acrobatics usher in the second season as the game's top stars, many of them rusty after two months off, get back in the swing of things. The midseason classic is won by the National League for the 10th straight year, and slowly but surely that little boy exuberance returns. When last we left Pete Rose in Veteran Stadium, he was in a holding pattern, needing just one more hit to become the National League's all-time leader. The cast is reassembled. 
And on day one of the second season, Pete Rose moves up to number one. It's a truly epical achievement, but Rose shows how to keep it all in perspective. Hello. Hello. Pete Rose? Yes, sir. This, this is Ronald Reagan. How you doing? Well, I don't know. I'll tell you. I've had as much trouble getting this line, or a lot. I think I had to wait longer than you did to, <laughs> to break the record. Well, we were going to give you five more minutes, and that was it. <laughs> I just what have we been having some trouble here getting through, and I just wanted to call and congratulate you. I know how you must feel, and I think it's great. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate it, and I know that you're a baseball fan, and uh, we appreciate you taking time out to... Uh, the calls here in Philadelphia. Far from the city of brotherly love, in Zurich, Switzerland, Sebastian Coe leads an assault on the year-old mile record held by Steve Ovet. Coe already holds the 800 and 1,000 meter records, and he was the gold medal winner in the Olympic 1500. Now, in his first mile run in two years, Sebastian Coe puts one more record in his name. Nomaz Roberto Duran breaks his promise and scores a close win in his comeback fight. While the PGA Championship turns into a cakewalk for Larry Nelson, his first major win. In the same month, one of the men responsible for helping bring both the PGA and the NHL into the modern sports era, Bill Jennings, passes away. And tribute is paid to this dedicated sportsman. August will be remembered most as the month of the Milers. A week after Coe broke Ovet's record, Ovet broke it back. And now, just two days later, Coe is trying to shave further time off the shrinking mile standard. Before 45,000 rabid fans in Brussels, Belgium, the 24-year-old Coe completes a truly astonishing 10 days, shattering the record by more than a second and leaving fans to wonder how much lower can the mile mark go. It's been 27 years since Roger Bannister broke the four-minute barrier. And Sebastian Coe's mile record is an almost unthinkable achievement. So Coe wins the August Performer of the Month Award for taking two out of three from his countryman, Ovet. Like father, like son, and we'll let you know why the golf world is singing the praises of this young star when the George Plimpton scrapbook continues right after these messages from your local station. It must have been never give up hope. 19-year-old Nate seems like he might just be a pretty good crooner in his own right. Quick now, which one of these players is singing the blues? Well, it should become clear in a hurry, as John McEnroe serves to Bjorn Borg in the U.S. Open Final. Trying to join the women's winner, Tracy Austin, McEnroe is disposing of Borg in workmanlike fashion, and he's just one point away from his third straight U.S. title. This decisive four-set victory leaves no doubt that John McEnroe is the top tennis player in the world. The best soccer player, in North America at least, is Giorgio Canaglia, whose New York Cosmos are engaged in a shootout with the Chicago Sting for the North American Soccer League title. When Canaglia's boot goes wide, Chicago's Rudy Glenn has the Cosmos facing sudden death. The Stings Championship reminds us that another summer game is approaching the playoffs. It's that time of the season when some baseball players get so caught up, they lose sight of what the game is all about. You gotta have heart. All you really need is heart. When the odds are saying you'll never win, that's when the grin should start. You gotta have hope Mustn't sit around and hope Nothing's half as bad as it may appear Wait till next year and hope When your luck is batting zero Get your chin up off the floor Mister, you can be a hero You can open any door There's nothing to it but to do it you gotta have heart Miles and miles and miles of heart Oh, it's fine to be a genius, of course But keep that old horse before the cart First you gotta have heart Finally, the two heartful welterweights square off With 300 million people watching around the globe Sugar Ray Leonard takes it to Hitman Hearn
trailing on all three cards, Leonard makes sure there'll be no mistake. It goes down as a 14th round TKO, and now Sugar Ray is everybody's champ. In becoming the undisputed king of the welterweights, Ray Charles Leonard earned eight million dollars. And perhaps of less consequence, he became my king of September. Congratulations, Sugar Ray. Still ahead, New York's 26 mile BN. And a couple more awards for the distaff side of the sports world. Serving up the honors will be Olympic gold medal winner Donna DeVarona when Sports 81, the George Plimpton scrapbook, continues. Falls a bit later than usual in this year's scrapbook. In fact, the October Classic nearly finished in November. Now, stay with me now and we'll get you to the World Series before the first snow. Montreal knocked off defending champion Philadelphia while Los Angeles stunned Houston to become the first team ever to win a best of five series after losing the first two. Oakland's Billy Ballers swept the Royals in three straight, while the Yankees barely hung on to beat the Brewers in five. So then there were four. Now, the Yanks clobbered the A's in three to win the American League flag, while Montreal and the Dodgers went down to the final inning of the climactic fifth game, tied at one to one. With the rest of the baseball world waiting impatiently, the Dodgers' Rick Monday eases into a dramatic showdown with the Expos' Steve Rogers. It's Blue Monday for Montreal, for this towering blast punctures the Expos' dreams of bringing the World Series to Canada for the first time. The plucky Dodgers have fought back yet again from the brink of extinction to capture the National League flag for Los Angeles. And these determined men in blue are writing a rather stirring comeback drama in October. And now it's on to that all too familiar pinstripe foe who insists on being uncooperative right from the very first batter of the 78th World Series. Greg Nettles larceny helps boost the Yankees to an early lead. But in the eighth inning, Steve Garvey represents the tying run. Nettles' almost mystical powers over the Dodgers are reminiscent of the 1978 series when last these two teams met. And his hot corner heroics have stymied the visitors' cold. Now, all that's left is a formality for Goose Gossage protecting a two-run Yankee lead in the night. New York breaks on top in the series, and the Bronx men prove even less hospitable in game two. Flamethrower Goose Gossage has returned to the hill to preserve Tommy John's shutout, and the Dodgers, it seems, can't stand the heat. The Yankees take a commanding two-game lead in the series, but now the scene moves to the land where fairy tales can come true. And the do-it-the-hard-way Dodgers have them right where they want them. Ron Say stands in with two on in the first against Dave Rigetti in what's expected to be a pitcher's duel. Say's three-run homer gives Los Angeles its first lead of the series. And a record Dodger Stadium crowd buoys the hopes of getting back in the series. With the Yankees trailing just 5-4 in the eighth, a struggling off-form Fernando Valenzuela is trying desperately to summon up another miracle. Bobby Mercer's attempted bunt turns into a rally-killing double play, and the home team hangs on to win behind their charmed rookie, Fernando. The Dodger-Yankee rivalry is starting to live up to its advanced billing now, and Jay Johnstone steps into the sixth inning of a tumultuous fourth game with the Yankees' Ron Davis working on a 6-3 lead. The Dodgers pinch hitter extraordinaire lines a two-run homer which changes the entire complexion of the game. A five-run Dodger comeback leaves the Yankees feeling helpless and Dodger fans exultant. Even seemingly innocuous fly balls are turning into adventures for the Yankees now. Reggie Jackson gains a touch of humility from the autumn sun and it's the Dodgers who look like the boys of October now. Game five is a comparatively quiet affair until the Dodgers erupt in the seventh inning. Back-to-back -back homers by Pedro Guerrero and Steve Yeager explode Ron Guidry's shutout, and these high-spirited Dodgers are simply not to be denied. Three straight comeback victories for L.A., and somebody upstairs is not smiling at the Yankees. Just one game from elimination, Yankee skipper Bob Lemon sends up a pinch hitter in the fourth inning of a tie game. The controversial decision puts Tommy John's arm away for the winter and opens the floodgates for the Dodgers. 
against a Yankee bullpen once thought invincible, the Dodgers pound out eight runs led by Tri MVPs Yeager, Say, and Guerrero. Second year man Steve Howe comes in to nail down the victory and LA's first World Series crown in 16 years. After losing the first two games of the series, the Dodgers prove up to the challenge, sweeping four straight from the Yanks, the ultimate triumph for the underdog. New York is a town of challengers, and it's easy to find willing souls even for a 26-mile race. But none of the 14,000 is nearly as able as Alberto Salazar, a 23-year-old Oregonian who makes good on his pre-race promise to run the fastest marathon ever. The race promoters are trying to make New York a marathon capital, and they get another boost from New Zealand's Alison Rowe, the top woman finisher. But the biggest story of all is that more than 13,000 runners finish this race. I have an admission to make. I've tried competing in nearly every sport imaginable, but when it comes to the marathon, I hit the wall, as they speak of it, even before I get out of the house. So Alberto Salazar is my choice for October's top performer, with honorable mention to Alison Rowe, this scrapbook is a way for us in the television industry to pay tribute to the world's finest athletes and their deeds. This year, we lost one of our champions. For 19 years with CBS and later with his own production firm, Jack Dolph epitomized the highest level of persistence, creativity, and excellence in the broadcasting field. It is not enough just to say we will miss the commissioner. We will always be in his debt. Give us a look at the other top sports women of the year. I'd like to introduce the president of the Women's Sports Foundation, our Olympic gold medalist for swimming in 1964, Donna De Verona. Thank you, George. It was a year in which women athletes reached new levels of personal achievement and continued their fight for further acceptance. And for the first time ever, two women were invited to join the International Olympic Congress. It was also a year which made us realize how far we've come. This year, the Women's Marathon was added to the 1984 Olympic calendar. And for us at the Women's Sports Foundation, it was a marathon effort as well when we gathered in New York City to pay tribute to two very special women. Over 600 people gathered that night to not only honor the professional and amateur athlete of the year, but also to recognize outstanding achievements. New Zealand's Alison Rowe, who'd already won the Boston Marathon, had traveled to New York for the New York City Marathon. As predicted, she captured first in world record time. Evelyn Ashford of Los Angeles, setting records at the 50, 60, and 100 yards, and winning the 100 and 200 meter dashes at World Cup 3 to become the meet's only double winner. Another performer combining grace, speed, and elegance was 15-year-old Elaine Zayak of Paramus, New Jersey, who triple jumped her way to a U.S. figure skating championship and a silver medal in the world competition. Swimming, as I learned a while back, is another sport which belongs almost exclusively to teenagers. Perhaps the most remarkable woman swimmer ever to dive into a pool is Tracy Calkins, a native of Tennessee who's now a freshman at the University of Florida. Calkins continues to break records while displaying her rare versatility, and in the early part of 81, she won four races in which she defeated the Moscow Olympics gold medalist. And because of this great performance, Tracy Calkins was the Women's Sports Foundation Amateur Athlete of the Year. Beth Daniel won the record $50,000 first prize in the World Championship of Women's Golf. While Kathy Wentworth, at age 41, became the first woman golfer to top a million dollars in career earnings. In tennis, Martina Navratilova won more than half a million dollars in 81, and several others weren't far behind. But the best player is not always the top money winner. And this year, the number one performer in women's tennis, and in fact, in all of women's professional sports, was Chris Everett Lloyd. The 26-year-old Floridian has played with a new maturity and confidence since her marriage to John Lloyd and since coming back from her 1980 sabbatical. She won six straight tournaments early this year, and her resounding triumph at Wimbledon proved that she's back at the top of her game. She was our champion at the Women's Sports Foundation dinner when she captured the Professional Athlete of the Year award.
One more development, George. For the last decade, due to grassroots participation, Title IX, and the leadership of the AIAW in collegiate sports, women have enjoyed more benefits and growth than ever before. So much so that the male-oriented NCAA has decided to institute Division I, II, and III championships for women. Well, George, that just means in 1982, women will have many more choices to make. The George Plimpton Scrapbook returns in a moment. One proclaimed parody in the pros, and there goes another number one in the college ranks. But through all the gridiron backing and filling, one man just kept rolling along. In Birmingham, the college football season is bear season, and Alabama's 68-year-old head coach, Paul Bear Bryant, is hunting down his 315th career win. The Crimson Tide escapes with a 28-17 triumph over Auburn, and Bear Bryant is the winningest coach in college football history. At Brigham Young, Jim McMahon becomes the passingest quarterback ever, setting 60 NCAA records, including most yards and touchdown passes. Stanford's another quarterback haven, but halfback Darren Nelson steals the spotlight. The shifty 5'8 Nelson gains almost 7,000 yards as a runner, returner, and receiver, and he breaks Tony Dorsett's NCAA record for all-purpose yardage. The top dog in the Deep South is a 19-year-old tailback named Herschel Walker, who becomes something of a mythical figure in Athens, Georgia. Walker's rise to power has made this a glorious era for Georgia football. And Bulldog fans have to keep reminding themselves that their gifted prodigy is only halfway through his college career. Walker is the nation's second leading rusher in 81, and he keeps Georgia in contention for a second straight national title. The tradition of excellence is continued at USC by senior Marcus Allen, the Trojans' workhorse tailback who emerges as college football's premier performer. The 6'2", 200-pound Allen follows in the footsteps of USC greats like Mike Garrett, O.J. Simpson, Anthony Davis, Ricky Bell, and Charlie White. But Allen's achievements outstrip even their legendary feat. Averaging nearly six yards a carry, Allen becomes the first collegiate to rush for more than 2,000 yards in one season. Mixing speed, strength, and stamina, Allen equals or surpasses the 200-yard mark of record 11 times, including five straight. Through a season of upsets, Marcus Allen stays at the top of the heap. On December 5th, Marcus Allen accepted the Heisman Trophy Award without undue humility, saying simply, <laughs> I would have voted for myself. Well, Marcus, you're my November Performer of the Month, not only for your elusiveness on the field, but for your candor off it. Allen would also be pleased to know that the old Heisman heck seems to have lost its steam of late. The National Football League's top four rushers through early December are all former Heisman Trophy winners, including St. Rookie sensation George Rogers, Billy Sims, Tony Dorsett, and Earl Campbell. But the elder statesman of the NFL rushers has never been one to crave awards or headlines. He just keeps picking up yardage. In his 10th pro season, a still resourceful Franco Harris remains one of the game's best, and he now seems to have a shot at Jim Brown's all-time yardage record. There's a parallel in the NBA, where the Lakers' Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is moving ever closer to Wilt Chamberlain's all-time career scoring mark. On December 1st, against the Utah Jazz, Jabbar takes over the number two spot on the scoring parade, supplanting his former teammate, Oscar Robertson. For that milestone basket and his continued brilliance after 15 years in the NBA, Kareem, all seven foot two of him, fits into the December Performer of the Month slot. And that means it's time for me to choose a Performer of the Year. But I think I'd better take another quick look through the scrapbook first. The Raiders' Jim Plunkett. Edmonton Super Center, the Great Gretzky. World Cup Champion, Phil Mayer. The Dodgers' Fabulous Fernando. Johnny Campo's Pleasant Colony. The Phillies' Ageless Wonder, Pete Rose. Tennis Maverick, John McEnroe. The Record Machine, Sebastian Coe. The King of the Welterweights, Sugar Ray Leonard. The Marathon Man, Alberto Salazar. The Heisman Trophy winner, Marvelous Marcus Allen. 
and basketball's best big man, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for, the winner of Plimpton's Performer of the Year.